All right, welcome back to Elden Ring, the Ultimate Guide Part 2. So just there, you saw the stats that we left Part 1 on. And uh, we're going to buy a torch from Cali immediately. Um, and the first thing we're going to be doing in this episode is going to Groveside Cave, which I suppose is like the first... Uh, the, the first dungeon, quote-unquote, that exists in Limegrave. And... Um, on the way, there's like a couple items. Like, well, there's this one golden rune to pick up, but otherwise, at the bats, pick that up and then just come straight here to Groveside Cave. Now, this place, I mean, there's so many dungeons in this game that are completely throw away without really anything relevant in them. Uh, and this is one of them. So, there's a lot of these to go through, and a lot of them are fairly underwhelming. And we're going to do every single fucking one of them. Yippee! I mean, you say there's nothing relevant. You did just pick up um, the cracked part there, which I guess okay, is so... technically a key item. So, okay, so strictly speaking, actually, the cracked pot is a relevant item. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of them don't have anything relevant. Okay, there, there's a better way of saying it. But that cracked pot is a very useful item. Again, as mentioned in the last episode, you use the cracked pots to make throwable items. And to just reiterate, if you use a cracked pot... To make a throwable item, once you've thrown that item, you still have the same amount of cracked pots. They are a permanent item, kind of like Estus flasks. So here is, I guess, technically the first overworld boss that we're fighting in the game. And we're just going to come in here, summon the Fang Dimps. And, I mean, they could pretty much solo the boss by themselves. Um, immediately you can see the choices that we've made uh, for this playthrough just coming in hot. With the Fang Dimps doing their thing, Ground Slam doing its thing, the Bleed doing its thing. Uh, I fight, I would find it genuinely incredible if that boss gave you any amount of hassle. And also drops a Flame Drake Talisman, which we might as well put on because it's the best thing we have 40 minutes into the game. So uh, now we just walk back to Church of Ellie and we are now going to Limgrave Tunnel which is um, basically the first place we can get a bunch of consumable items. Now, if you head up to the bats, you can actually just drop off this little ledge here and onto this ruin, and this is actually kind of like a faster way of getting down, which is one of the few things that I managed to teach uh, our lovely co-host Josh, isn't that right? Yeah, um, I, I can't begin to express how much I love that. I, I genuinely never thought to even attempt it, and then I saw you do it while you were getting the footage for this and i was enamored immediately i was like well I'm doing that every single time now because it's so much fucking faster than going from agile <laughs> lake north it's now true. the uh the tunnel type dungeons pretty universally have these little platforms around the lift and so it's um generally a good idea to get into the habit of send the lift down take the platforms down to the bottom because more often than not, there's an item on there. It's usually a golden rune, an extra smithing stone, something like that. Um, so it's well worth just going around them to check. Yeah. Now, in uh, these tunnels, uh, there are smithing stones in the walls that you can see via these sort of, like, yellow rocks. So remember to look about and pick them up. Obviously, we pick all of them up, but just keep an eye out just in case you don't see us pick up every one of them. The enemies in these tunnels tend to be slightly somewhat stronger to the slashing katana weapons that we are using. So that's where uh, Ground Slam, again, just pays dividends in the fact that you just get to pancake every single enemy and it pretty much one-shots all of them, which is uh, it's just it's fantastic. And this is a, a continuing trend that will last throughout the game. Uh, again, you just saw another example of why Ground Slam is good, because it hit a bunch of rats around us, it didn't just hit the one that was in front of us. So it's just truly fantastic. Um, also, please ignore that Steam pop-up. <laughs> That's got to become a theme, I can tell. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, if you wanted an alternate method of dealing with the miners, they are exceptionally weak to striking damage. So if you were to just go to Round Table and buy the mace from the Twin Maiden Husks, or find a club off of the several enemies that drop it, or the one merchant that sells it, um, it's a useful tool just to keep in your back pocket. Um, if you wanted something specifically for dealing with miners and 
uh, a couple of bosses that you are likely to encounter in dungeons like this. Assuming you don't have access to Ground Slam, I suppose. I mean, even with Ground Slam, like, it's not a problem for us later in the guide, because we switch to the Great Stars, but if you didn't want to, for whatever reason, um, having something like a blunt damage weapon as a tool specifically for dungeons like this isn't a bad idea. So, as we, you saw, we went round the back of that little hut there and picked up uh, another smith and stone. Uh, as I said, there's like a whole bunch of smith and stones in this area, which is kind of why we come here like straight away. Um, because uh, getting these upgrade materials as early as you can in Lime Grave is the best thing you can do. Now, as you saw there, just to point out, we jumped off the middle of the lift. We didn't go all the way up to the top. Um, and this is how you get to the boss. Uh, there's a glintstone scrap right there, which is a very interesting thing that they have here because this actually pretty much allows you to beat the boss just by using these glintstone scrap items that you can pick up. And uh, we're going to show you that method. And it's it's just very... I mean, this boss shouldn't really give you much hassle, but it's possible that it could give you a little bit of hassle if you're very new to the game and you're just kind of getting to grips with things. Um, there's another Steam notification. Fucking hell, but... Uh, aye, the glintstone scraps will make this boss um, pre pretty much free. Like, it just kills the boss for you. It's, it's, it's awesome. One of the many things I taught you was cheese methods. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was. I just had no idea. It's just one of those things that you wouldn't even think, like, why would the devs even do that? But, uh, yeah, I suppose it just uh, goes to show you, try and use everything that you pick up. Everything has some kind of use. Now, you might be wondering what the fuck we're doing here, and it is because uh, we are next to a stake of Marika, which is essentially like a worse bonfire. If you die, you can respawn either at a stake of Marika or at a bonfire, uh, the last bonfire that you're at. But if you, the stake of Marika is closer to the boss, so it means that you can just kill yourself, respawn at the stake of Marika, have all your healing items and full health, and then just run straight to the boss again. Um, and this is a technique we use multiple times through the guide, um, and it just means we don't need to go in to fight a boss without being, like, you know, max HP and max flasks. Um, so, yes, yeah, I think it's a pretty good technique. So here we are at the boss, and uh, we're just going to equip the glintstone scraps just to show you how good they are. Um, so there's large ones and there's the small ones, and also we can just uh, summon the fang dimps, and this boss is uh, it's free. But also yeah, the... ground slam just fucks the boss up as well. There's, it, we we are coming at this boss from so many angles. It's frankly it's it's a shame. Like we're kind of just committing like war crimes on this boss, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Little tip for troll enemies in general: if you hit the face, they will do this animation that you're seeing on screen now. Um, yeah, and it generally makes them more passive, easier to deal with if you want to use ranged. So if you're a spellcast or you're using a bow, you can uh, pretty effectively trivialize all the troll type enemies in the game. Uh, and the glintstone scraps done that for you as well. Now we got the roar medallion from that boss boosts uh, all roar and breath attacks, so that counts for the dragon incantations, it counts for anything with the word roar or some uh, some synonym of it, so things like Shriek of Milos or um, Barbaric Roar, Braggot's Roar, things like that. It boosts the strength of those, and in tandem with that, it boosts the strength of the charged R2s that are changed by those Ashes of War. Now, what you might also have noticed there is we went to Hugh and we upgraded our Uch Katana. So, um, at this point, you can now upgrade whatever weapon you're using, because we've picked up a bunch of uh, Smith and Stones from Limgrave Tunnel. Um, so, that's, you know, that's why we went there. Now, we're warping back to the first step, and we're just going to jump off this cliff. Um, and the reason for that is um, these big wind pockets uh, allow Spirit you to just springs. jump down. Spirit Springs, but, yeah. Just try to have a more descriptive name for them. Sorry. Um, <laughs> didn't want to just use a noun. But yeah, so we're, we picked up a, a cookbook from him uh, just because we're going to pick up all the cookbooks uh, in the entire game because it's obviously like it's an important key item. But now that we are down at the beach after jumping off the cliff, we are coming here, which is a coastal cave. 
And this is where we're going to meet Bok for a second time. Here he is, just uh, lying in the ground. So this is where Bok's quest will continue. You need to defeat the area boss. Um, you get an item, you come back, you give it to him, and when you do, he'll play a lengthy animation where he'll stare at his open hand. Don't rest at the grace trying to speed it up. It does not work. You'll just have to watch the animation again, so let him play his animation out. Um, and then when you do rest at the grace after uh, finishing his dialogue completely, he will move. And the next time you'll encounter him will be in Leonia after taking on the major area boss for Limgrave. But in the meantime, we're just working our way through this cave. Now, this boss isn't difficult. Uh, just sometimes it can, like... At this point in the game, maybe very slightly take you by surprise because you have to fight two things at once. Now, to mitigate that, we can, in fact, summon this guy, uh, which is a... Uh, Istvan. Now, a combination of Istvan and the Imps and Ground Slam should make light work of this boss. Um, although I have been uh, caught off guard by it, don't get me wrong. Now, we can go into a stealth mode here and crouch around here and uh, kind of get, uh, get the jump on the boss, so to speak. And here it is sleeping. So what we're going to do is we're going to use Ground Slam and... Uh, as you can see, Ground Slam even pancakes this size of enemies. And this is why it's so good. Now, Ground Slam isn't infallible. As you saw there, um, the boss did knock us out the air with his attack as we were mid-Ground Slam. But for the most part, most attacks won't do that. That only happened because you were out of blue. And yeah, it is possible because uh, if you use Ground Slam and you don't have any mana, you get like a weaker version of it. But ideally what you want to do is not go too far into the cave and aggro the second demi-human chief. You kind of want to take one on at a time. But uh, it, plus there's like a whole bunch of other demi-humans in this cave as well. So um, yeah, you kind of just want to split this boss up as much as you can. You really don't want to be fighting all of them at the same time because that's when it's going to be like a little bit of a problem. Because as you can see, it's it's taking decent damage, but it's you're not melting it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say Demi-Human Chiefs, if you were to fight them solo and underprepared, like, not knowing what you're getting yourself in for, this could be one of the tougher bosses in Limgrave. Like, early on. But luckily, it's not. So, again, just working our way through the cave here. I mean, this is just kind of nothing. Just pick up the items that you see as pick up, kill the enemies you see as kill. But what we can talk about is the enemy drops. And these are demi-humans. Now, they can effectively... Most enemies in the game will drop the weapon and stuff that they're holding. Not all the time, which is why we have to fucking mention it. So the demi-humans can drop the falchion, the club, the spiked club, uh, the great knife... Or the Great Knife Roped. I maybe I misspelled something there. Uh, the Bloodstained Dagger, the Rickety Shield, String, Glass Shard, Rune, Fragments, Rainbow Stones, Glow Stones, and Volcanic Stones. Now, before we get into more drops, here we are at the um, the Dragon Altar. Um, and there's two of these in the game. And the more dragons you kill, the more dragon spells will become available. When you kill dragons, they drop dragon hearts. And you use dragon hearts to buy the dragon spells. Now, we do utilize some of these in, for the guide, uh, one in particular. Um, that'll be relevant when we get there. But it is uh, essentially um, a big poison breath spell. Um, and it's extremely fucking useful. I cannot wait to demo Rot Turret. I'm so Oh, I can't excited. wait as well. You're going to love it. So, we got a somber smith and stone there uh, from that uh, particular scarab. Now, somber smith and stones differ from normal smith and stones. Uh, the somber ones are used to upgrade, like, unique weapons in the game. Um, so, yeah, there's, like, two different types. Of the so, okay, so quickly before I get to that, this is Bok. So you give him the sewn needle, and you get the, the animation that you're talking about. The painfully long animation where he stares at his hand. Hurry up, Bok. I'm getting annoyed watching this in post. 
God, it takes so long. It's agonizing. So yeah, now that you spoke to him, you can leave. Now, um, in the last part, we put Storm Stomp that we got in the last part onto a dagger that we also got in the last part. Now, we're going to whip that dagger out with Storm Stomp. And there's, you can see this sort of like glowing path that's shown up. Now, these are invisible scarabs that make this kind of glowing trail. And uh, they're quite hard to hit. However, Storm Stomp is incredible at getting past that because it, it leaves a big lingering hitbox around you. So you don't need to be accurate. Um, so that's why we highly recommend you do that, just for getting rid of these fucking invisible scarabs. They are way more hassle than they should be. So we went, another we head back to... Actually, I was going to say, another thing that you taught me, I didn't realise how useful uh, Storm Stomp was for taking out the uh, invisible scarabs. You're welcome. So here we are at... Um... Oh fuck, what cave is this one? This, this is Stormfoot is... Catacombs. Indeed. So, this is one of the first uh, catacomb-style dungeons, and this one is filled with imps. Uh, now, these guys uh, are it's essentially the same thing that we are summoning as part of our spirit ashes, uh, and they are quite hardy. You can see they take quite a lot of damage, but there is a way of mitigating that, and that is by using the um, guard counter ability. Now, if you have your shield up and you take a hit, and you've blocked a hit essentially immediately after the hit press r2 and you will guard counter now that is an attack that does quite a lot of damage quite a lot of poise damage and for imps if you guard counter with a katana at the very least and other heavier bigger weapons you will stagger them and and you can go in for the counter hit and um, this will make imps so much more manageable like this is the method for beating imps 100 percent. now where the tunnel type dungeons, um, like the one we took on earlier, contain a lot of smithing stones and somber stones. The catacombs are where you come to get your glove wart. Now, grave glove wart and ghost glove wart I use to upgrade the spirit ashes. Grave glove wart are for the regular mob type spirit ashes, so things like the fanged imps. And for the more special uh, spirit ashes, you would use ghost glove wart. So for the likes of the Mimic Tear and Lutel the Headless that we will be getting um, in one of the coming parts. So here is why the bow is good. We use the bow there to shoot this pillar and then that lowers the fire trap. So it means that we don't need to, to, to time it. We can just shoot it from a distance. Now we picked up a Prattling Pate there, which is just an item that gives a little sound emote. It doesn't actually do anything other than um, just say hello. <laughs> it's kind of cool. <laughs> I like it. Um, the the equivalent see... of the carvings from Dark Souls 1. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we used the bow again to shoot down this pillar. Now, this room, I have died so many times to the amount of imps that are in this room. So I highly recommend that you bait out each one, one at a time, because if you get mobbed by a bunch of imps at the same time, it can be like a genuine problem. Now, to go over what the imps drop well the imps actually do seem to drop that the weapons that they're specifically carrying so that is the fort hatchet the fort great sword imp heads of various types they all have a different head the cat fanged the long tongue and the wolf um so they have a chance of drawing their specific head piece um they also some sometimes drop smoldering butterflies glintstone butterflies forger blooms mushrooms and smith and stones of various strengths at various points through the game so as you can see, we're just kind of working our way through these imps. Um, you really, really don't want to get uh, ganged up by them. I think there's five or six there, and that is just quite a lot, considering that they do bleed damage, and considering how much HP you have. That ain't a good combination of traits, I'll tell you that. So it's worth noting that the devs really like using imps to ambush you. They stick to walls, they stick to ceilings, um, they'll hide behind door frames and attack you from behind the door frames. Um, as you enter a room, they can be a real pest to deal with, so just be aware that they are going to do that to you. And some yeah. of them will catch you out. Like that one there being right at the side of the door 
happens all the fucking time, and they're also quite fast with it. A lot of the time, you might try, you actually actively try to dodge it, and you still get hit by them. So yeah, it's a bit of a pain in the ass. Now we picked up the Wandering Noble Ashes there. It's almost not even worth talking about because compared to the Fang Dimps Ashes, it's there's just no contest. The Fang Dimps wins every fucking time. And there's another Trouble. example of an imp trying to fucking ambush you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for large chunks of the games, the the imp can just straight up carry you. The imp ash is it's just so good. It's good in so many situations. Surprising amounts of situations, actually. The imp will just do the job for you. Yeah, like, they have a ranged attack. Like, I mean, again, we've said this, but... They're, they, they're surprisingly tanky for what they are. They're very agile. They dodge a lot of attacks. They have a ranged attack. They do bleed. They're aggressive. There's two of them, so they split aggro three ways, not just two ways. There's so many good things about the Fang Dimps Ashes, and that's probably why they have it as like a starting gift, to be honest. They're probably aware of how good they are. So here we are at the Air Tree Burial Watchdog. Now, you are the... Uh, the boss expert, so go on. So, Burial Watchdog, generally slow, but its attacks come out very quick. This attack here, the Fire Breath, would give you a huge window to get damage in, as you just saw. Um, as long as you're behind it, or it's aggroed on something else, you can use your Ash of War. And you saw there, actually, Ground Slam avoiding the attack. You actually sailed overhead because of the little crouch animation. Um, they are insanely weak to blunt damage. Um... And there is even a duo fight that you will see how we trivialize that. It's fucking hilarious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, just Asha Wart is a uh, ground slam just paying dividends. Uh, now we're back at Church of Ellie and we're using the souls we got to level up. We now have 20 vigor. Go us. Very fancy. So we are now heading south past the, uh, the first step. And this is, um, Kind of, sort of near the bit that we jumped off down to Coastal Cave. Uh, but here we are, it's, it's at a bit of a stone pillar, and we're dropping off the edge to get this silver pickled uh, foul foot. Now, that's an item that you can use to increase your item discovery? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so it's not something that's really ever going to come up very often, unless you're trying to specifically farm for certain items. Um, and if it's anything like the other Souls games, it just increases the amount that things drop it doesn't make things that are a rare drop drop more um but i suppose it sort of technically does but you still get all the items within the same ratio but here we are jumping down to this um this beach here and uh there's another uh just some random enemy that we need to deal with that again ground slam just uh completely fucking trivializes this is the first of many old men in underwear enemies. Um, <laughs> yeah. this, one, uh, this one, I think, is an Alabaster Lord. It just dropped Gravitas. That's the Ash of War you saw Old Knight Isfan using earlier. Oh, um, sure. It's this big AoE, pulls enemies towards you. It's it's generally pretty great. Um, it's not as slim. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not as slim, but <laughs> what is? What is? <laughs> you know? <laughs> we just grabbed the Halo Drake Talisman as well. Well, and if you'd have dropped off the ledge where you picked up that talisman, you would have been in the starting cave where you first spawned in episode one. Yeah. Uh, we're coming up to Yura here. He is a pretty important NPC, actually. He's tied to one of the endings. Here he's advising you to not go out onto the lake because a dragon will spawn there. Um, he's telling you not to do that. If you die to the dragon once, you can summon Yura to help you. And if anything, he actually makes the fight harder because it means you can't use Torrent anymore. Um, so yeah, you might be he... wondering what that cut was just to make a point uh, this enemy took about a minute and a half for me to kill um, turns out you can just use start you can whip out the dagger and spam storm stomp against enemies on horses and they it'll just make them come flying off the horse because it stuns them um, but you'll see that a bit later uh, now we just used the uh, the bow to shoot that scarab that was in the um, that was in the lake and then we are heading to uh, that grace. Then we grabbed a little item on the camp. And now we are heading to the Dragonbird Ruins and jumping over this wall and down these la down these stairs, rather. 
And this is where we get the Twin Blade, which is actually a pretty good weapon. There are better alternatives to this weapon. But ultimately, the Twin Blade is pretty good, especially if you put Bleed on it. Yeah, Bleed Infuse it. You can swap out its Ash of War for a lot of very useful things. Things like Spinning Slash um, does good poise damage. It's good at crowd control. Um, generally, the Twin Blades are alright. Um, I personally not a huge fan, but they're not bad weapons by any means. So if you did want to use one, feel free. So um, when it comes to dogs, a good strategy is kind of like the imps where you just kind of want to block an attack and that will kind of stun the dog a little bit. Uh, just a kind of quick aside, but otherwise we are now still in the ruins that we're at and we're heading down this flight of stairs now Which is uh, the main one that isn't hidden behind the wall you need to jump over But when you kill the rats and open this door and then open this chest It is a trap that teleports you to a place in the map called Kaled or specifically Celia Crystal Tunnel Which is a dungeon in Kaled. Now whilst we're here we are going to go on a little item run that is going to give us a little bit of a a boon right at the start of the game, essentially. Uh, there's a bunch of items that we can pick up where we don't actually need to fight any enemies. Um, when you're running out this cave, by the way, keep rolling because these enemies will shoot you with like a homing attack. But um, otherwise, yeah, we're going to pick up some items out in the swamp out here. Um, just because they're going to just give us a little bit of boost at this point in the game. And I think it's worth it because you don't need to fight anything in the process of doing that. So why the fuck not? Let's go shopping. <laughs> we get a couple of important items out here, so notably we're about to, I think, grab one of the scarabs, one of the invisible scarabs. Yes. Um, this one, I think, drops an Ash of War. I believe this is poison armament. Um, yeah, I think it is. And, uh, yeah. Just yeah. just showing you how fucking good Storm Stomp is, by the way. Go on, try try and just hit one of these by timing a katana hit. I fucking dare you, because you won't do it. Um, <laughs> Next item we're picking up here. is Rot Dog. Um, Rot Dog is actually exceptionally good. It Correct. is a true glass, glass cannon ash of war. It will basically fold like an omelette as soon as it takes any kind of damage, but if it can proc the Scarlet Rot status effect on an enemy... Um, it will take off a massive chunk of its health over the right. course of, I think it's about uh, 90 seconds it lasts. Uh, now, just to quickly reiterate what we're doing there, um, we headed along the this side of the bank to another grace, up the stairs, and keep going up until we got another golden seed. It's just sitting there, we might as well pick it up. But uh, yeah, the, the, dog, the dog is good, but it will... Um, it will be uh, squashed into oblivion. It is not a tanky summon whatsoever. So again, just because of the amount of damage that the imps put out, it is they, they are still better than it. But the rot dog is still good. Now here we are. This is a kind of an example. If you don't time, uh, if you if you don't can, if you can't get to your uh, scarabs from the right direction, they run away like that. That one dropped sacred ring of light, which is okay. It's an Ash of War for Pearl Arm type weapons, things like Scythes, Halberds. Um, it's okay. Um, it has some trouble in tight enclosed spaces though, and if you're looking for holy damage, it is completely outclassed by Sacred Blade that we picked up in Episode 1. So yeah. just use Sacred Blade, don't waste your time with the uh, Sacred Rings of Light. If you want the better version of that Ash of War, there are enemies in that swamp, the Clean Rot Knights. If you can get one to drop the Halo Scythe, the Halo Scythe has that Ash of War built in, and the pre-built version of that Ash of War is significantly stronger than the equipable version of that Ash. So we are switching to morning, because if we are here during the night time, there's uh, two strong enemies that we want to avoid just now. We also upgraded our flask there with the, um, with the golden seeds that we've picked up so far. So there's a couple of um, golden seeds, yeah, sorry, uh, rune packets that are floating here. Uh, golden rune 2, who gives a fuck? However, golden rune 5 is kind of decent for this point in the game. It's just lying on the ground, so why not pick it up? And from here, we are going to run up this rocky bit of hill. Uh, and there's a bit of a drop off, like kind of cliff edge here, as you can see. And uh, this is, we're just going to suicide run to try and get this item here. Now, this is one of the uh, cracked tiers 
for our Physic Flask. But as soon as you go down and grab that, a whole bunch of giant crows just immediately come barreling after you. So just keep running, grab this golden seed if you can. If not, you can just come get it in like a second. But uh, we're just doing it in one run to save time. But you will be chased by many giant aggressive birds. So just keep running and just keep trying avoiding them. Because again, it's not worth fighting almost any enemy in this game, to be honest. Especially not the giant birds with murderous intent. These things are still a pain in the ass to fight now after hundreds and hundreds of hours in this game. Um, there are methods you can use against them if your weapon does a lot of poise damage. We spent quite a while workshopping a solution for them. And we do come up with one eventually, but we can't really do that until the very end of the game. So you'll see that when... You'll see it when it happens. Aye. Aye. So uh, here we are. There is another um, scarab in this swamp. And this one drops poison breath, I'm sure. Oh, poisonous mist, rather. Which is the Ash of War version of poison armament. I think. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, cool, cool. Uh, it does essentially the same thing. Uh, now, something to bear in mind is that you can shoot your bow on the back of Torrent. However, if you're standing in the swamp on Torrent, you do not take the poison build-up. Um, so just bear that in mind. Uh, and then we're picking up the map fragment for this part of the map. Because why wouldn't we? And then from here, we're going to talk to uh, this merchant who also sells a pot. Uh, but we'll pick that up in due course but for now we are going to buy the uh the great helm which is um just a little bit of a defense upgrade for now but it is the best helmet that we can really kind of just straight up buy guaranteed uh for quite a while actually so we'll be wearing this helmet for the next probably 10 hours give or take So something I do want to mention, actually, about the cracked pots from that merchant. If you picked cracked pot as your starting gift, those pots will not be there because it takes them out of his inventory and puts them into yours at the start of the game. Ah, yes, yes, that's true. Now, we're buying some arrows um, because it's useful to have a surplus. Uh, again, you should buy the pots from Kali that you saw there. Um, they are obviously like a key item. Uh, we do pick them up eventually, um, just not just now i mean there's nothing really to craft that's useful so you don't really need to buy them but uh just i want to keep reiterating that cali does sell cracked pots and they are worth buying uh very much so so we're running across the lake and under that little bridge bit and now we're going to um we're gonna go see patches but before that we're gonna get invaded by um nigeris question mark N nerius <laughs> So Nereus, the bloody finger, will invade um, after, I believe it's after you do an amount of damage to him or he does an amount of damage to you. Yura from earlier will be summoned automatically to assist you in the fight. Um, there you are. So if you need a little bit of backup, which doesn't look like we do because Ground Slam is based, um, based he will come in to support you. Um, so yeah, yeah so just to make... just no go. On. Oh, I just so because Crown Slam is so good, we managed to just rock uh, Najiris's world, and then Yura gets summoned in, but he doesn't even have time to reach us because we've already just fucking annihilated this guy using our fucking fat bossy. So now we're in this cave. Um, there's a little noise trap thing uh, which uh, can alert the enemies if you uh, cross over it, it makes a little dinging noise. But like, these guys aren't an issue at any point in the game, so fuck them, who cares. Just, uh, you know, just kill them or whatever. Just hit them with your weapon. That tends to be the, the best way of doing that. They do um, have a unique set of drops though. Uh, um, yeah, these, they do. The Bandit Highwaymen, I think is the name of the enemy. Um, they drop their full armor set, they drop daggers, I think short swords as well. They can drop mushrooms. Um, yeah, they do. Yep, you're right. Um, the full high human set, the short sword, the dagger. They can drop bolts, smoldering butterflies, and mushrooms. Seems like a lot of yeah, things will drop smoldering butterflies. Now, this is a bit of a weird encounter. It looks like you're about to enter a boss, and you sort of, kind of are, yes, no. So open this chest, and patches will show up. 
and um, he'll be pissed off that you're trying to, I don't know, pill for his pajamas, I guess. So you need to fight him for like a little bit, uh, and once you do a certain amount of damage to him, he'll kind of like yield to you. So yeah, just like that. So it really isn't worth it to kill him, to be honest. You can kill him at any point after you've done his quest. And um, if you don't kill him, wait that little bit of time and you'll get the grovel for mercy um, gesture. So we're just... You have to warp back to the start of this cave um, and then speak to Patches again to get him to move. Now it's actually... To make a point, it is much better to warp back to the starting grace of a cave than it is to use the little teleport thing. Because the teleport thing doesn't refill your health or your Estus flasks. But the um, if you warp back to the, the starting grace, it does do that. And effectively is the exact same process. So now we're back at patches. Just going to forgive and forget. Because we're, you know, we're, we're nice like that. And he will become a vendor. He sells some pretty useful items as well. He sells Margaret Shackle. Um, that becomes a very useful tool. Um, yes. Pretty much all the way through the game. And not really for its intended purpose, to be honest. Um, <laughs> Correct. However, its intended purpose does come up three separate times. So there is that. This is true. Um, he also sells fan daggers infinitely. They're probably the strongest throwable in the game that you can buy an infinite number of. You get them from patches. You sell some gold pickled foul feet, so if you're running short on runes, um, they're great. They give you an extra 20%. Um, he sells a cookbook, which we're going to pick up right now. And patches... Um, his quest ties to... Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so there's another chest that's appeared in his room. When you take it, it's a transport a track. You get some dialogue on this loading screen from patches himself, and it drops you right by the bear and the item that we didn't pick up in the Mistwood in part one. Yes. Now, now, the reason we didn't pack that up is because this bear is a... Uh, he's, he's a fucking Giga Chad Sigma bear, alright? Now, you do not want to fucking fight these things. They are some of the worst enemies in the entire game. Uh, so we're just going to get on Torrent, grab these fucking items, and just get the fuck out of here. And just hope we don't die to this bear, essentially. that That is the process. There isn't a technique. There's no tech... Well, there is a technique for these bears... But it requires a whole bunch of um, late game items that we do not have. So the best way to win against the bears is to just not fucking fight them. And uh, we're As just going to is the case away. with a lot of enemies. <laughs> this is true. There's a lot of enemies that have like a very easy, specific strategy. The bears... we Look, we do get a fucking fantastic strategy, don't get me wrong. But um, we currently have no means of enacting that strategy. So we're going to warp back to Patches, and we're going to be like, what the fuck was that about? So you, you do have to hit him a little bit. Uh, you have to get him to now aggro onto you. And it'll give you the opportunity to yield. Um, he'll yes. give you a gesture that you can use to beg for forgiveness from him. And when you do this, he will calm down and go back to being a merchant. It's kind of a unique interaction, actually. I do kind of like this, even though the groveling for mercy is um, a little bit buggy. Um, yeah, I think I have sometimes to it doesn't maybe work do it first twice. try. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't work first try. Um, like you just saw there, we were in the gesture, and it just didn't didn't come off. Um, I'm gonna do it again. Oh. No, you're just going to sit in an acid cloud. Nice one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, just just keep at it. It will work. It's um, a total pain in the arse trying... Because you have to, like, fight him whilst fiddling about in the fucking menu. There and there we go. Goes. <laughs> yeah, Patches really is just a... He's, he's not actually a real vendor. He's just the guy who gives you a bunch of gestures. You get his squat eventually, you get the prostration gesture, uh, you get the calm down gesture. All of these come from patches. That's really his role throughout the game is to just give you a bunch of notes. Yep. So now we are warping. So as you saw, we warped back 
to the first grace rather than using the teleporty thing and our health and flasks are restored. Um, it's just so strange that that teleporty thing doesn't do that. Like, it doesn't make any sense. I can't believe they never fucking patched that back into the game. It's like, why would you ever use the teleporter instead of the warp? I can't. We can't think of a reason. But heading coming up, up to this... Yura uh, again. What's uh, your well, so We're coming up to Yura again. Oh, Yura yes. has now moved here because we fought Nereus. Um, just exhaust his dialogue and that progresses his quest in the natural way. The next time you'll encounter him, I believe, will be Leonia. Yes, I think so. So here we are. Uh, this is a good example of some of the worst areas in this game. Uh, this is a tiny, tiny dungeon uh, with almost nothing in it. And um, there's, I don't even think there's a, a particularly good reward or anything like that. Uh, there's a bunch of imps. So we're just going to use the, the the now patented classic method of dealing with these fucking things. And that is uh, Aslam and guard counters. It's just so effective. It really, really is. Um, I, I feel quite bad if people didn't know about this technique for fighting these things. Um, it's it's relevant the entire game, literally. So, yeah, get get yeah, because... used to doing this several hundred times. <laughs> you can actually use this trap on the floor here. There's a big square pressure plate. If you time it right, you'll see it can actually damage the imps for you. So instead of wasting your time getting peppered, you can just use the trap to kill them. Yeah, um, and it rely resets on them. as well. Yeah, which is nice. Um... Yeah, there's lots of little, there's lots of opportunities to do things like this. You can do it a couple of times in Leonia. You can do it on Altus. Um, you can do it inside the royal capital at one point. And there's another ambushing imp because they just love putting them around corners. They fucking love it. They fucking love it. Miyazaki yeah. try to not put an imp around a fucking corner challenge impossible. You grab the one item in this area, the fucking root resin. It's a consumable. You can get an infinite number of them. Um, so I'm glad they made that a specific item that you had to pick up. And then, oh, we rounded one corner, and there's the boss. Um, yeah. I don't even know why, why they even fucking put this in the game. They could have done anything. An afternoon of thought would have made this better. I, I, I don't get it. It is filler, the dungeon. Yeah. <laughs> um... So yeah, some more glove warp. So as we said, this is a, a glove warp st like style dungeon, whatever you want to call it. So you will get glove warts in these catacombs. And uh, now we are on to the boss, which is the Grave Warden Duelist, which uh, lo and behold is uh, extremely weak to everything we are attempting to do in this game. So uh, ground slam, fantastic. Bleed, fantastic. The imps, I mean, so fantastic. Simply put, if it bleeds, you can kill it. Like, yeah. A great man once said that. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Predator. <laughs> See, uh, uh, there we go. It was just like these fucking imps paying dividends. Just proc and bleed constantly. Uh, we're using Ass Slam. It's breaking this thing's poise. We can get our counter hits in. And then we get Banished Knight Engval, which is actually pretty okay as far as the um, the uh, Spirit Ash summons are, to be quite honest. So as I mentioned earlier, there's two different types of Glove Wart. There's the Ghost and Grave Glove Warts. Um, Grave would upgrade the Imps. Um, Ghost would upgrade the Ashes like Engval. So typically the ones that Ghost Glove Wart would um, be used to upgrade are the ones with a name. Now we've yeah. come up to the Artist Shack up here, and this is the first of many paintings, and the idea behind those is you can look at the image in your inventory and you have to find the spot from which the painting was painted. So when you do, a ghost will appear, then disappear and leave an item behind and you get a range of rewards from this. I think that one would reward you with the incantation scarab, which is a headpiece that makes your incantations... I think it makes them cost more in exchange for doing more damage. Yes. And then there's another scarab that we picked up just there. Um, again, using our patented technique of um, ball side first is what we're going to 
Guess we can just uh, call it that. Oh, so just Christ. progressing along. We speed this bit up um, simply because we're just kind of running about and I was trying to gather my bearings uh, for where it is. There's basically just there's, there's like a smithing stone one up up this hill and um, the map was kind of vague about where it was so I was kind of running about trying to find it but um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you'll have a much easier job. And then there's also this golden rune too, that was just also what I was looking for, and I just couldn't find it. So making our way to this camp, there is a uh, Kaiden cell swords. Also at that Kaiden cell sword in that camp, we picked up the an armorer's cookbook. So just pretty important that I mention that. Now, what is it they drop again? So the Kaiden cell swords can drop their full armor set. The the dismounter weapon, pretty good. It's a curved greatsword, um, one of the only ones you can change the ash of war on, which makes it pretty versatile. Um, they can also drop all the different kinds of raisins that are a consumable you use to heal exclusively torrent. Now, you can also use the red flask to heal torrent, and if you've taken damage as well, that's a great option. If only torrent has taken damage, then the raisins are probably a better bet. So here we are at another cave. Um, and this one is... Oh, what's this one called? Again? I Road Cave. Yes, and this is actually one of the better caves in the game, admittedly. Um, it's a little bit more interesting than the other ones. Now, we're just making our way down this big hole, and uh, there's some wolves in this cave. Nothing nothing particular of note. Wolves and bats. Um, also, the boss is kind of easy. Oh, it's, honestly, it's, it's actually kind of shit now that I think about it, but it's interesting in layout at the very least. <laughs> yeah, one of the more visually striking caves. You do get a cool weapon in here as well. Um, that you get is Shamshir. It's actually, we end up... Um, it's not that we explicitly use it. On the first playthrough, uh, the first iteration of the guide, we did in fact use the Shamshir. Um, it is actually good enough. Um, because being a cur curved, like the normal sized curved swords are very, very good. They're very, very fast and can do a lot of bleed build up. Um, so that's why we we're initially using it. It just turns out that the great stars are better. So, uh, here we are moving on. There's some sleeping wolves that we can kind of get the jump on by literally jumping on them, I guess. And, uh, so there's two paths to go. You can take this left path, which kind of leads up the way. And uh, there's this item here, which is a fucking arteria leaf. Yes! On the amount of items <laughs> in this game, the amount of items that are, you're like, oh, what's this big icon here? This is going to be a good item, and it's a fucking arteria leaf every single time. And as much as they are somewhat useful for crafting, I don't give a fuck. It's really just a case of, I'll take it, thanks, I'll put it on the pile with the rest of them. Yeah. So, um, here are the bats. These bats are actually, uh, I mean, we've, we've, we've uh, encountered them before, but they are extremely annoying enemies. Um, we do eventually get, uh, in the next part, actually, we, we do get an Ash of War that makes them a lot easier to deal with, um, which is Bloody Slash, which is like, has a, it's in a slash attack with a really long, curving range so you can kind of hit them out of the air with it but um otherwise just kind of you know block them when you can get your hits in when you can they're not they're not the worst thing ever but still a bit annoying something up that's... This waterfall. i was going to say that? something that's worth noting about the bats is that um if you use any gravity type damage on them so like the gravitas ash of war that we got earlier um it will ground them it will pull them out of the air um making oh, them sure. absolutely trivial and if you're using the block and then attack strategy against them, just be careful because they have a grab attack that will hit you through your guard. So there was the Shamshir. Now, just to make note of this, we uh, very slightly edged off the waterfall and then dropped down onto like the bottom platform. You have to be very careful that you don't um, overshoot that. Now, here we've got a land octopus. Uh, now, they can drop the octopus head piece. Um, that's quite rare. Uh, and then they can drop their ovaries, strip of white flesh, and sacramental blood. 
But the way to kill them is if you hit them with two charged heavy attacks, so two charged R2s, it will always break their poise and then you can go for the critical attack. Also, uh, you know, hitting them with a ground slam is pretty good as well. But um, yeah, just uh, two charge attacks is uh, probably a little bit easier. Other thing to note is the charge attacks have to hit the face. They have yes. to hit the beak because if it hits the body, it will do very little damage and next to no poise damage. So you have to be right in the danger zone to fight them. They're actually one of my favorite designed enemies in the game because the way that you fight them is entirely unique. So here we are fighting. Um, this is a different golem from the tunnel golem that we've already fought. Uh, but these things have glass ankles that, again, Aslam is just fucking phenomenal at dealing with. Uh, now, these enemies later in the game actually do a decent amount of damage, but this one is pretty weak. And um, two ground slams will break its poise, and then you can just go for the critical, which does a fucking insane amount of damage. <laughs> like, frankly, laughable amount of damage. I don't, I don't, I don't understand. But then we just we just hit its legs just with a like a normal attack there and it went down. So yeah, these things are nice and easy. And uh, I think this is coming up near the end of this particular video. There's another couple of little things to do. Um, so heading back to patches. I think now we buy some items off them. I think now is when we buy the Margit Shackle now because we just got a bunch of uh, like a surplus of souls just there. I'll mention as well the item we got from the golem, the blue dancer's charm. It does increase your damage, but only if you're below a certain weight threshold. So if you were wearing very light armor or no armor at all, it would give you a damage increase. But the amount it gives you, I don't think is worth the talisman slot. So for now, you're better off just keeping the uh, flame drake or Haley drake talisman. Yeah, agreed. Now, here we're just going to sell our runes, uh, simply because it's it's easier to sell runes than it is to use them in the inventory and, like, pop them manually. But we're heading back to the round table hold, and uh, now is a great opportunity to upgrade our weapon, because we've got a, just picked up a bunch of upgrade materials uh, during this the last 50 minutes. And, I mean, we're really keeping the pace up here, but... There's a lot to do in Limgrave, so this is uh, part one of Limgrave, and uh, there's part two where we'll be wrapping up the north of Limgrave. And uh, we're just going to bring our endurance up to 18, because we want to get parity between our uh, health and endurance, and that is it for part two. So you made it to the end of part two. Join us in the next one for part three, where we're doing the final part of Limgrave. And if you enjoyed this video, then you can follow us on Twitch and Twitter, because who the fuck is using Facebook anymore? And if you feel particularly generous, you can sling us some cash from Patreon. But ultimately, the best thing you can do is just give this video a like. Or just comment anything. For the love of God, comment anything. But if you're feeling especially spicy, then maybe you could subscribe. But other than that, we'll see you in the next part.